we had the pleasure, um, as these guys were slugging it out to persuade you of what to think and how you should vote, of doing our best to inform you and help you make up your own minds as to how to vote with the best information we could find. Um, to reflect on stats in this referendum is perhaps a little bittersweet on several levels, but just to remind you, it, stats were used in about three different ways in the referendum. One is, of course, privately by the campaigns in planning their own work, and rumour has it, though we don't see it, they were used very effectively. The discipline of statistics did well in the referendum. They were used publicly in polling, and other people are much better qualified than I am to talk about the successes and failures of polling in the referendum. And then they were used in the public debate to help the public make up our own minds. And that is the area where Full Fact was day in, day out, at almost any hour of the day, involved in trying to help people make sense of what was out there. And what was out there was sometimes right and sometimes helpful, sometimes absent, sometimes unhelpful, sometimes inept, sometimes inaccurate, and sometimes persistently inaccurate, even when mistakes were pointed out. But let me start with inept. There's a tendency, I think, on all of us to be cynical about politicians, and it's been demonstrated uh, by Ipsos Mori's polling today, as it has for many years. And yet, cock up usually explains things better than conspiracy. And there are two examples of statistics use in the campaign, which I thought were a fascinating glimpse behind the scenes of the campaigns. One was David Cameron as Prime Minister, insisting that actually there was a balance in the number of Brits going to the EU and the number of EU people coming to the UK not that long ago. I think from memory it was 2007. Which is what the ONS spreadsheet says. Unfortunately, another part of the ONS release says these numbers are no longer to be trusted and have been deprecated. Please don't use them. And the Prime Minister had accurately reported a set of numbers that the ONS had published that didn't lead where he wanted to go. I assume that was cock up, it's the natural explanation. Vote Leave said that more than half of net migration comes from the EU. They said it in a leaflet that went through a lot of people's doors. They later stopped saying it in subsequent leaflets. In that case, if you divide net migration from the EU by total net migration, you get more than 50% seems perfectly reasonable, as long as you don't take, to, uh, take account of the fact that net migration of British citizens is negative. We have net emigration of Brits, and so that piece of mass just doesn't work. Again, it seems like something a non-specialist could very reasonably do and reach an apparently honest but wrong conclusion. So the first thing that's quite striking is our public statistics apparently are too complicated for bright, knowledgeable policy people to be able to use and deploy accurately in the context and under the pressures of a referendum campaign at the pace they're working at and at the level of scrutiny they're working at, which is a warning, I think, to us all. So let's move on from ineptitude, and I don't mean that critically, by the way. I do understand, and we've done it, um, just how um, difficult it is to work at that pace, to be fair at that pace, to be accurate at that pace. Full fact makes mistakes too, and I'm not getting on my high horse, but let's not for a moment assume that all statistical mistakes are in fact lies. When it comes to inaccuracy, of course, the most famous figure of the campaign, and perhaps the only one anyone really recalls, is 350 million pounds. We send 350 million pounds every week to the EU. I should quickly qualify that, lest the quote be taken out of context. We don't. Um, <laughs> we would send 350 million pounds a week to the EU were it not for the rebate that Margaret Thatcher um, negotiated. Um, with the rebate, we send something closer to 250 million pounds to the EU. And the EU spends some money in the UK. So you could bring that down by another, roughly speaking, 85 million pounds a week. So if you really want to help people make up their own minds about the EU, you sort of need to present both of those figures and let people decide which ones they care about. We don't control the money the EU spends here, but it is part of the picture. What's interesting about that 350 million, for those of you who've had the pleasure of going to the ONS pink book, table 9.9 .9 from memory, and it used to be scarred on my memory, <laughs> is that you can go to that table and you can find the figure which divided by 52 
makes 350 million. And it seems, in the context of the Pink Book, which is, after all, the ONS's definitive publication on these things, like a completely reasonable thing to do. If you talk to the ONS, and by the way, we've done that in the past. If you talk to the ONS, they will tell you, actually, don't use our figures, use the Treasury's. Um, and the Treasury has another book, and that explains actually what does go to and forth to the EU. And if you follow that through, you sort of understand what the breakdown is, and you can reach the 250 million. So one of my intensely interesting questions about 350 million is, was it a mistake in the first place? Was it somebody honestly going to that spreadsheet and just getting the wrong end of a stick? And then it kind of got something that the campaign got stuck with, partly because it took a while to be pointed out. Perhaps we'll never know. Perhaps we'll find out this evening. So we've got the inaccurate claims, and there were inaccurate claims on both sides, and then we've got the persistently inaccurate claims, the claims that were stuck with even in the face of detailed explanation of why they didn't stack up or why they couldn't be used in that way. The, um, in the words of the poet, bloody buses come to mind. Um, but partly in that, there was an enormous industry of evidence creators in this referendum of think tanks and research institutes and public bodies, including, in fact, Her Majesty's Treasury, creating august-looking reports, very carefully reasoned reports, some of which were actually, on deeper inspection, much more rigorous than others, and some of which, though rigorous, were summarized in ways that were at risk of misleading people. The £4,300 cost to UK families if Britain leaves the EU, that's a direct quote from a billboard that was released the same morning as the Treasury report on its future economic projections if we left the EU. 4,300 cost to UK families if Britain leaves the EU. It's not exactly nuanced, nor is it exactly a fair summary of the underlying research. What fascinated me about that evidence generation industry was sticking sources on things didn't actually help anybody. It was amazing what you found source colon ONS next to. And it was amazing how unreliable some of those claims were. So that's a sort of little tour of the landscape of what we found during the referendum. Let me take a step back and talk about full facts role in all of that. A lot of people think fact checking works by turning up and explaining to people that they're wrong and that, that makes things better. Um, and I invite you to imagine the person who comes to your party and does that. <laughs> so you're having a nice party with all your friends, and unfortunately you're talking about politics, and then somebody w walks in who thinks they know more about politics than you and all of your friends, and tells you that, and then tells you that you're all wrong. That's a very odd way to think that fact-checking can really work. And it is one of the difficulties of working in the context of a referendum where people avowedly didn't know very much and avowedly didn't care very much. So how does fact-checking actually work? Well, actually, what Full Fact does most of the time starts with doing that fact-checking. And that fact-checking serves our direct readers, who by and large are more interested in politics and by and large more interested in numbers than the typical person. It serves those people we can reach through the rest of the media. And you'll see us on all kinds of shows. We're on Five Live today talking about Facebook and accuracy. You'll see us you know, wherever we can get to spread the, the news to a wider audience. And then it goes and it asks the originators of claims to correct the record. So we have secure corrections on the record from the prime minister, from MPs of different parties, from um, public bodies, from trade unions, from most national newspapers. And in doing so, we've helped take inaccurate claims out of circulation. And in doing so, we have also assembled an evidence base of where inaccurate claims in public life come from. And by dint of doing that, assembled the means to diagnose ways of preventing them coming back again. And, though, and so we go for systemic improvements. We talk to organizations like the UK Statistics Authority, the press standards organizations, and ask them to strengthen processes to make sure that these kinds of mistakes don't happen again. And that's actually been very successful. You know, one short letter or one extra line from the ONS can cut out whole swathes of inaccurate press coverage. And that's a remarkable opportunity and responsibility. But all of that takes time. You can't do that quickly, and you can't do it in six weeks. 
And if you don't have time, you have to have money. And for context, full fact was outspent by the campaign's at least 100 to 1. But just as importantly, money in time. When we tried to raise money to start doing the groundwork of informing the public about the EU referendum two years before it happened, almost nobody bit. Only the Corporation of London would give us anything, and that £20,000 didn't go quite far enough. Um, so we come to this referendum. Very few people know very much about the EU. Unusually, they're willing to tell pollsters that. Usually, we, we bluff a bit, don't we, but not on the EU. Very few people care that much. But when it came to the launch of a campaign, the BBC did something fascinating, and I think greatly to its credit, which was to say, our opening article is going to be, what is the EU? The BBC met people where they actually were, recognized that we were all working from a low base of knowledge, and tried to step into that gap. And then in the few months we, we, we all had, we had to make the best of the information available. We, uh, who also, by the way, have an obligation to be impartial, objective, nonpartisan, and balanced, <coughs> managed to publish something in the order of 185 fact checks, 25 videos online on a whole range of different topics. We fact checked all the main leaflets, we fact checked what the Electoral Commission put through your door. We sat in ITV studios and fact checked the live TV debates. We were delighted when J.K. Rowling tweeted, you know, here's an impartial source finally, sort of thing. And we were even more delighted when we saw in the Daily Mail one day an interview with Andy Murray, who said, well, he was asked, what do you do about the referendum? And he said, well, I go to Full Fact. Bit of a surprise, but a very nice newspaper to get a plug in. <laughs> so we did our best to provide rigorous information based on primary sources on a whole range of topics. But the two campaigners are absolutely right. But firstly, there was no status quo here. We are a changing country and a changing Europe, um, as the academics rightly put it. And secondly, the, the campaign was dominated by things we cannot know, possible futures and possible pasts. And the job of a fact checker so often isn't to provide black or white answers, it's to provide the shades of gray between apparent certainty. And at best to say, here is the range of what seems reasonable to deal with. On the question which I suppose will always haunt the question of accuracy in this referendum of 350 million, in many ways I wonder if the, the question I would revisit isn't so much how do you explain 350 million, which I think we did reasonably well and which was top hit on Google and reached a lot of people, um, but actually how do you put it in context of the fact that economists both on the Remain side and on the Leave side thought that the impact on the economy of leaving the EU was something like 10 times the size of the EU membership fee. So on their own terms, the membership fee was something of a sideline. And there's a question, I think, for fact checkers as to whether or not it was our role to be contextualizing that argument as well as explaining the facts about what it was. So what do we make of all of this? Um, firstly, Fact-checking was clearly a, a good service to those it reached. It was a good service to a lot of journalists as well. The number of journalists who confronted with a statistic that they had heartily demanded, and I couldn't agree more that we should ask for them less, and that actually the reliance on statistics as an excuse for a press release has not done a lot to inform our public debate. Um, but those journalists who demand a statistic from you and then ring us up to ask what to make of it, um, clearly need more help and more support in analyzing the numbers they're given. And it's good to see the BBC has been putting some focus, which Jill Matheson can talk about, into reviewing its stats capabilities. For us, I go back to those abstinence statistics. Um, James mentioned, uh, no, sorry, Matthew mentioned the proportion of businesses that uh, export to the EU. A simple number coming from Matthew's mouth was, I think, two weeks of work for one of my colleagues. We went on the grand tour of the statistical establishment, the Office for National Statistics, HMRC, the Department for Business. None of them had the answer to that question. And when we eventually got the three answers that were available after going in at the highest level and basically begging and pointing out that there was quite an important national decision in front of the people, um, 
it turns out that one version of it is between VAT registered businesses in this country trading with VAT registered businesses in another country and therefore leads out non-VAT registered people. And there are a couple of other versions that are all complicated. Now, they all come out to somewhere in the region of about 5 to 11% of businesses export to the rest of the EU. There is a hinterland of businesses that supply those, which I think can bring it to about a quarter from memory. Um, for numbers, we're basically broadly accurate. But diligently checking that, diligently justifying, does it stack up? Where are the primary sources? What can we show people that they can choose whether to trust or not? And what are the caveats that people might need to make sense of those claims? That's days of work for us, caused by a minute of press for vote leave. And that's the nature of fact-checking. It's asymmetric. It's much, much easier to put a claim into public debate than it is to respond to a claim, even a correct claim, or a, a claim which is within a reasonable range. So how do we respond to all of this? Firstly, we've got to get ahead of the game. I mean, absolutely, we ought to have as much money as the campaigns do. Um, <laughs> But the BBC is pretty well funded, um, and they're talking next. But let's get ahead of the game. <laughs> um, not as well funded as they'd like to be. Um, let's get ahead of the game. There is no reason why the question of how many businesses export to the EU was unpredictable. There is no reason why somebody could not have looked at the pink book and said, this is going to be at the heart of a major national conversation. And that's why I'm delighted that we and the UK Statistics Authority, which is, as everyone in this room knows, responsible for the Office for National Statistics, and the Economic and Social Research Council, and the House of Commons Library, are joining forces to do a program called Need to Know, whose job is to look forward over the next few years and say, what are the big decisions we're going to be making? What data do we need? What analysis do we need? And is that well communicated? so that people have the information they need when it comes to making decisions. And I think getting ahead of the game and releasing that information before it's in the heat of a political fight is one of the ways that our important public institutions can really help serve the public at this time, and I think that's a great initiative. The second one for us, and more in-house, is that we're investing in automated fact-checking, in being able to monitor claims we previously fact-checked and respond to them instantly to instantly say, that's something we previously fact-checked, and here's our conclusions, to be able to spot the spread of claims through public debate and understand what the sources are that really matter and where the interventions we can make will make the most difference. And then finally, we're investing in our media partnerships as well. Um, we're working now with LBC on a weekly video series we do with them. Our PMQ's coverage is appearing in The Telegraph. We're in Huffington Post. That's on top of media outlets in the referendum that included, I think, almost every major channel and every major newspaper. But to have those regular relationships vastly expands our reach. So those are three things that fact-checkers can do or help do to make the next referendum, the next election, better informed. I want to perhaps put two challenges, or three challenges, actually, out there. One is the referee that was mentioned. We have the UK Statistics Authority. It did step in on 350 million. I think it's a very difficult role for an organization like that to encounter a referendum like this for the first time in its history. And I think one of the questions the authority will be thinking about is when to respond and in what way to respond. But nonetheless, we had an authoritative statement about what the statistics could and could not justify. The next step is for our statutorily independent, accurate broadcasters to respond to that authoritative statement. I quite understand that broadcasters do not want to take it upon themselves to become the arbiters of statistical accuracy. But as we've had one legislated for by law, when it does rule, I think there's room for the broadcasters to respond and not mention those statistics without also mentioning the response of the UK Statistics Authority to them. The second is to all the analysts in the room. We know far too little about far too much. And in particular, we spent the referendum dealing with averages and aggregates. What is the effect of this on the whole country? And nobody can tell me the dividing change in GDP by the number of households in the country overcomes that problem. We need to get far, far better at understanding the marginal impacts of policy decisions and public choices and not just the average impacts. Who will be affected and how will those people 
be affected. And I think that's a big challenge for the coming years to get higher resolution data and analyze it more effectively. And finally, my challenge to the two campaigners, if I may, we came perilously close, I think, during this referendum to scorching the earth we all stand on. We work with fact checkers around the world. We had a visit today from our friends in Argentina. Now their attitude to public statistics is perfectly simple. They just don't trust them. They have to make up their own. And that's a really tough country to live in and an even tougher country to be a fact checker in. We are lucky to live in a country with such rich institutions, such by and large trustworthy institutions that work hard to do a good job to inform us. And yes, absolutely, political challenges to the role of political organizations can be necessary, but we should also be very, very careful that we don't scorch the earth we're standing on. So when I see, for example, organizations like the Institute for Fiscal Studies, questions not on the quality of their analysis, which by all means let's argue about, but on whether they are driven by ulterior motives, I think we're on the edge of a very dangerous game and we're on the edge of losing very important things from our public life. So one of the lessons for me from this year is that actually reasonable debate that helps people is a choice we all have to make um, and something we all have to push for and vote for. And that's what we've been doing at Full Fact. Thank you very much.